Hi, um, welcome back to um, these stories of the Sistine Chapel. Um, I'm going to give you um, a couple of more tips before, before I get started. One is when you go to the Sistine Chapel or to Rome or actually to vacations where you're going to see a lot of churches, uh, bring binoculars. Um, you have pretty small ones these days that are, these days that are good and powerful. So um, a lot of the stuff you're going to see is far away. So it, it actually helps. And another thing is, um, take your time. Uh, rem remember, at all times, you're on vacation. The, the biggest mistake I see people make in, in Rome um, is they run from church to church and from, from museum to museum because they want to see everything in, um, in a week. And I have news for you, you can't. And if you try, you're going to forget most of it. Much better would be to see less but remember it properly and to enjoy it at the time. Um, have long lunches lunches, and long dinners. They're good at that in Italy. <laughs> the wine is pretty good as well. So enjoy yourself and that's uh, taste the entire country, not just the art. And um, that goes for the museum as well. I've told you, ideally you go to the Vatican Museum twice, once just for the Sistine Chapel. Um, but even if you can't make that, take your time. Have a cup of coffee in, in between. There, there is a bar inside the museum. And um, in the chapel itself, um, you're not allowed to talk. You're not allowed to sit down. And they do try to sort of push you over to, to um, get you to leave again so you make room for others. Um, and... You have to respect the no talking thing and you cannot sit down, but what you um, should not do is be pushed out. Take your time and um, have a good look around. Let it work in on you because there is a lot to see. And, um, and it is uh, a spectacular place to, um, to look at. Now, let me get you um, some pictures. Um, I um, told you last time about the um, uh, about the walls of the Sistine Chapel, um, and the whole thing at the time was was uh, built and decorated under Six, uh, Sixtus the Fourth. Now Sixtus the Fourth, his reign lasted within the 1480s, and um, there were a few popes after. And at, in the early 16th century, there was Julius the Second. So it's a big generation gap, about 20, 25 years later. In, in history, there's, um, there's Julius II. And it's, it's, it's literally a generation later. He was the nephew of Sixtus IV, um, both called Della Rovere and both, both from uh, Genoa. Um, now, Julius II, you, this is a portrait of him in, uh, by, by Raphael. Um, and you wouldn't say so when you look at him like this, but um, he was called the warrior pope. He fought lots and lots of different wars. and um, he was very, very ambitious in well, his, his uh, let's say, his politics, in, in his art projects, um, and not so much in his spiritual leadership. And, um, but in his art projects, he was, um, he gave the order to rebuild St. Peter's. Um, Saint, there had been a St. Peter's built in the fourth century. So by the time he was Pope, it was well over a thousand years old and, um, and it was falling apart. They hadn't kept it up properly and um, stone masonry work had started to fall off and um, had actually hurt some people. And so it was barely in use anymore and they had to build a new one. This, this decision really had been made earlier, but um, this is not something you do immediately and um, you have to have a plan and finances. And he found some and he uh, contracted um, well, the most... Um, talented or most famous uh, architect of his day called Bramante. And Bramante came to, uh, to Rome and brought with him a, um, they sometimes call him a cousin of his, but I don't think they were actually, actually related, but Raphael. He was a much younger um, and very talented um, painter, of course, and um, came as sort of the entourage of Bramante and um, Ra uh, Julius II recognized the talent and, uh, and found a job for him. And there were lots of others around 
and of course he hired Michelangelo. He hired Michelangelo, Julius II, um, for a different project to uh, actually to build his tomb. Um, he wanted an enormous tomb uh, with um, with f over forty uh, figures on it, um, each of them over life sized and all made of marble. So marble. So it was a very very um, well, gargantuan sort of sort of task, uh, and it was to be placed in St. Peter's. Now, obviously, that was a problem because St. Peter's hadn't been built yet. In fact, they were demolishing the old one and rebuilding new bits inside the demolishing building, and it was a mess. And he couldn't, Michelangelo couldn't get to work. He, he couldn't even plan exactly where he was going to place the tomb. So he made some drawings, and that's about it. Um, and then he got the job for the Sistine ceiling instead. Um, you could say that um, the Pope had to give him some something else to do because he couldn't really send away someone like Michelangelo without causing some something of a diplomatic uh, problem with, with the city of Florence. Um, but he got to paint this ceiling and that was a job he didn't want to have because Michelangelo hated painting. Um, and he told the story to his later biographer, Giorgio Fasari. Um, Giorgio Fasari wrote a book of, of the, called The Lives. Of, of, it's a collection of biographies of artists. And Michelangelo, he knew Michelangelo was a big fan and, and he, uh, he interviewed him. And he, because he was such a big fan, he believed everything Michelangelo said. And Michelangelo, in his interviews, sculpted his own image um, the way he would be remembered. And for a very long time, we, we all believed exactly what Vasari had heard. Um, and what he told Vasari is that um, Michelangelo um, was such a big talent that every other artist in the world wanted to get rid of him because he was a threat to everybody. Um, Michelangelo was very arrogant. Um, I don't think he was a very nice man, actually. I'm, I'm a pretty big fan, and I, I think I wouldn't uh, wouldn't have a beer with him. He was arrogant. He was um, ill-tempered. He um, was violent. Um, he m didn't trust anyone. He was he wasn't a nice person, I think. Um, but um, and he didn't trust anybody else. And he thought he was a genius, the biggest genius ever, and everybody else was an idiot. So I would say hard to get along with. Um, and his version of the story is that there was a conspiracy. Uh, and this conspiracy was um, set up by um, a family of artists called the Sangalo. Antonio da Sangalo and the, the Sangalo clique or the, the group around them would, would have conspired to, to get Michelangelo to, make, to get a big project that would take him a couple of years. Um, and he would it would be something that he didn't like doing, he wasn't good at doing, and so he would fail at it and no one would ever see it because it was in a, in a place no one ever visit, visited. Now, if that was is actually true, if this, this was a conspiracy to get him to do that, that, this was the perfect plan. Because indeed he hated painting and it, the Sistine Chapel, no one ever went there because it was just for the conclave and, and a couple of masses a year for, for the Pope. It was barely in use. So, um, and the ceiling, people didn't paint ceilings. They were usually blue with, with gold stars and maybe some apostles on them or disciples. Or hardly anything there. So it, was, it would be clear that it was a leftover job. And Michelangelo had just failed at a fresco project in Florence. It, it didn't work out because he got into a fight with... Um, with uh, the other master had worked there called Leonardo da Vinci. Um, so he really hated doing that. Now he was um, set, he, um, he got this job to, to paint 12 apostles on the ceiling. And what he did is he uh, hired uh, assistants from, um, from workshops all over Rome. We know he did that historically. Um, Bramante started making scaffolding for him. And he started making preparatory drawings and he pretty much wanted to get it over with. Um, and um, 
as he, uh, at a certain point, he had what he called a moment of inspiration. Um, and he kicked everybody out. He kicked all these assistants out. He fired everybody. He um, uh, destroyed the, uh, the scaffolding idea that the Brahmans had started working on because he said it was an idiotically stupid thing to build. And he built a different type of, of scaffolding that covered about a third of the, of the ceiling. And um, he would stand on it and work on that. Um, legend has it that he had to lie down to work, but he didn't. He stood up. And we know that um, for several reasons. You can see the, uh, the place where his, his beams were, um, were attached. And um, there's this drawing. There's a, there's a, this is a poem that he wrote about working, standing up, working overhead, and, and working on the Sistine ceiling. He wrote a lot of poetry. And there's this sort of doodle on the side, on the side in the margin, where uh, you can see him standing up, working over his head, well, kind of doodling God on the ceiling. Um, but it turned into this, an enormous project that, according to Michelangelo, he did all by himself. He had one assistant and sometimes a second one to hand him stuff, and that was it. Now, these days we know that's not true because he, um, uh, he paid bills for, many, for a couple of more assistants. So he had more assistants than that. But it, still, it's, a, it's an enormous job that he did mostly by himself. Um, by the way, all his bills uh, were always signed as the sculptor Michelangelo. He, he hated the idea of being a painter. And um, I'm going to move myself a little bit out of the way because... Um, I'm on top of the ceiling there. Um, you have to uh, understand that he had uh, one, th this, this whole ceiling, it's about 14 meters long and 13 wide. And um, his scaffolding was uh, covered about a third of that distance. And he worked from, as we see it now, from left to right, from the entrance of the chapel to the altar. And you can see that because at first, um, you have to understand that there's this, 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 this um, sort of um, imaginary um, architecture. All these beams and things are painted. They're not actually there. And set within these, these beams, you can see a number of different uh, scenes. They're all scenes from the um, book of Genesis. The storyline, as we look at it from here, goes from... Um, from right to left, but he worked from left to right. So he started with the last scene. And at first he was working close to the, to, of course, close to the ceiling on his scaffolding and he was working from drawings and painting it on the ceiling. And only after he'd done the first third of the entire ceiling, he moved his scaffolding and then he could see it from a distance. And he noticed that he made the figures too small. There's too much detail and you can't really see them from, from the ground. Again, that's why you should be, bring binoculars. Um, so in the second third, the, the center bit, he made the figures somewhat bigger in, in these scenes so you can more easily find them. And in the third bit, he made them even bigger. Um, so that's how you can tell which way he worked. But um, I have my cursor here so i'm going to point it out to you a bit um, the storyline starts here and there's these these paintings that seem to be set within the architecture that he painted that's the main storyline which is as i said um, from the book of genesis and about halfway through you get to the most iconic and most famous scene of all which is of course this one um, and if uh, where where god gives life to, to adam and um, within that, there's, of course, this detail, which is even more famous. But if you look at the entire ceiling, you can see that it's difficult to find. It's, of course, only a detail of the entire ceiling. Now, I'm going to take you through the, the scenes of Genesis first, which is just going from um, this side. And I'm going to take all of these, these paintings within the painting. And then I'll tell you something about the other figures. But let's start with those. Um, this is the first scene, which is actually over the altar. So it's the, the, the beginning of the narrative. And here you see, of course, the last painting he made, but the first in the story. 
God is is separating uh, light and darkness. So um, it's day one of of creation. And the second day, he creates the earth. That's just in the in the corner here, you can see him uh, making some uh, on 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 the on the left. You can see him some making some greenish stuff. That that's earth. And then he makes uh, sun and moon to light during the day and during the night. Um, actually, the first time I was in the Sistine Chapel was before the last restoration. You couldn't see the moon, so he was just sort of pointlessly pointing at uh, behind him. But now that it's cleaned cleaned up, you can see that there's a moon there. And then he um, created uh, he separated land and. Uh, of water and sky, and then land and water. And of course, we skip then to, to the creation of Adam, this the, the most famous bit. Um, Adam just reclining, being calm. He, uh, he's not startled at all, then suddenly he was given life. And God just sort of effortlessly um, hands his hand. If you, if you um, hold your hand just without any... Um, motion then you, you sort of make that movement it's it's to show how completely effortless this was for god it's so easy for him um a fun detail about it is he's of course flying in this sort of cloak that that's, that's behind him and there's there's cherubs and sort of angel figures behind him um but he has his arm around someone the other arm he has around someone you see that it's a woman it's it's eve Eve is already on his mind. He um, he has already planned Eve, because in the very next scene, um, he pulls Eve out of the rib of of Adam. Um, then the very the scene after that, of course, um, trouble starts. They they um, eat the apple and um, and are kicked out of Eden. Um, also, a lovely detail I think is that the the pretty face that Eve has before the apple and the ugly face she pulls after um, and adam as well by the way they're they're both they both become more ugly as they as as sin sets in now there's a skip in the story of of genesis um but the next scene is um is the sacrifice of of noah noah sacrifices and gets to hear about the flood and so he um starts building um, the ark, and these are the this, these are just about the last scenes of of um, of the main story, and you can see that these figures are tiny. Even if you're this close up, um, you can barely make them out. the The ark is um, is in in the background, and there's actually Noah and his family are on it, and they they are beating people off who are swimming towards them, trying to climb aboard. Um, way too small to see from the ground and so again binoculars there great for this sort of thing um and the last scene is where you see noah uh, the drunkenness of noah noah after the flood um he made a vineyard made wine drank it got drunk and fell asleep naked and his sons mocked him now uh, it's the very last scene it's just over the entrance of the um, of the chapel and what's so cool about it is that's as far as you can get from the altar. Over the altar, you see God separating light and dark, so the very essence of divinity. Um, as far as you can get from the altar within the chapel, you, you have the scene um, where the spirit is as far away as it could get from God within, well, within Genesis. Um, uh, that's just in a nutshell, this, this, this storyline from, from um, right to left. And uh, around them, of course, there's a, there's a bunch of other figures. There's, there's all these uh, prophets. There's 12 figures seated around the, um, the, uh, uh, the center. Um, and because the ceiling is sort of curved, they look much more like they're sitting on something solid than just sort of hanging in the, uh, in the sky as they, they do on a, on a photograph. So if you see them live, you'll see them sort of sitting on something. Um, because if you see them up, up, up close, this is, this is Ezekiel. Their names are written below them, so you can actually make them out. Um, and Ezekiel, God is talking to him, and he's doing so through a, through a spirit, through this angel standing behind him. And the power of Michelangelo was that he 
he painted these figures sitting motionless, still, but they're powerful and they're animated. They're they're doing something well while, while they're doing nothing, and that's the real power of of Michelangelo. So many painters try to to copy that. In fact, when Michelangelo took a few months off during the project, um, he had forbidden anyone to go into the chapel. During the entire project, no one was allowed in except for the Pope. And um, Raphael gained access. And Raphael saw these, these prophets and thought, this is brilliant. And he, he copied one and he made one in the same sort of spirit in a church not that far away. Um, Michelangelo, of course, found out and had to be stopped. He wanted to beat up um, uh, Raphael, which may sound more dramatic than it is. He wanted to beat up people all the time. Um, but there's not just prophets. There's also these uh, female figures. Um, of the 12 figures, there's five female figures. They're called Sibyls. And these Sibyls are um, uh, not really prophets. They, they come from uh, not from the Old Testament, but are a Renaissance invention. You see, in the old days, in the ancient times, Greek and Romans made all these wonderful things. Um, but how could they, um, Renaissance people would say, when uh, if God never talked talk to them? Um, so they said, well, God did talk to them. They just didn't understand it completely. Typically Renaissance sort of reasoning. Um, the places where God talked to them was through these oracles. And um, this lady called Delphica represents the oracle of Delphi. There were more oracles than just Delphi. And each one of these sibyls uh, is uh, a representation of one of these oracles. And in, at Delphi, of course, there were women sitting around um, inhaling toxic fumes, probably, or being otherwise stoned. And they were rambling. And these ramblings would then be interpreted. And some of, and a lot of these ramblings have been interpreted into sort of sentences, and some fit really nicely in the Christian narrative if you want them to. Um, and so they made them sort of prophets um, uh, um, later on, in uh, thousands of years later. Um, the original job, by the way, had been to uh, paint not prophets. On the um, on the ceiling, but disciples. And the fun thing is, there's not not one disciple on the on that whole ceiling. And Michelangelo maintained that that was his idea. He he didn't even ask for permission. He just did what his great talent told him to do, and everybody accepted it. They probably asked for permission though, but that that's what he wanted us to think of him. That that he was the first artist ever to simply make a work of art and. Um, the people who paid him, the people who uh, who ordered him to make uh, make these works, uh, just accepted what he did, um, which would be the first time in history that anyone did that. Um, this is one of those prophets, by the way. This is Noah. Um, that's why there's a fish there. Noah is being eaten by the fish. There's a bit of problem with scale here, I think. Um, this fish doesn't look big enough to, to swallow him whole, not a, let alone keep him in his stomach for three days. Um, anyway, uh, if the plan was to to, um, uh, to get Michelangelo out of the way and not give him any jobs for, for a long time and that he would fail at this project, uh, that bit of it didn't work. Um, it was shown to the public for the first time in 1512. And... It was such a big success that within a year or two, uh, tourists started to come from all over Europe and eventually from all over the world. And uh, they came in drones. It's, it's the first real tourist attraction where people came not to, to see a relic or anything, but just to see this modern work of art um, for its beauty alone. And it was copied so many times that it's hard to imagine that there's any work um, of art that is so influential is anywhere near as influential as this one again take your time go and see it top of the bucket list um, there's more of course because he uh, about 25 years later he would start painting a wall see you in the next video where, where i'll uh, explain that see you there